Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the November, no, what month? October, right. October 2020 um, meeting of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. Uh, I We usually start with introductions, which I'm slowly getting better at doing on Zoom. Um, although it's so much easier to go around the table. In any event, um, I will just start. Um, my name is Eitan Nasreddin Longo, and I am chair of the panel. And next, let, I'm just gonna go around my virtual whatever this is. Julio. Yes. Go ahead and introduce your wonderful self. Um, I'm Julio Thompson. I'm an assistant attorney general and director of the attorney general's civil rights unit. It's good to see you all this evening. Hey, Rebecca, I haven't seen you in ages. We have some catching up to do. Pepper. <clears throat> hey, uh, James Pepper, the representative from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Great. Heather. Heather Simons. Hi, I was just thinking which Heather. Heather oh, Simons. <laughs> That's okay. Um, Heather Simons, Director of Professional Standards, Department of Corrections. Great. Loretta. Loretta Saki. Hi, I'm Loretta Saki. I am with the CSG Justice Center. Thanks for having me here. Great. Elizabeth Morris. Hi, um, I'm Elizabeth Morris. I am the Juvenile Justice Coordinator uh, for DCF, and I um, am not here as, our, as the representative, but I'm here with our new representative, Tyler Allen, who will introduce himself a little later on. Yes, you will. Christopher Loris, please. Yeah, uh, Christopher Loris. I am a research associate with Crime Research Group, sitting in for both Karen and Robin this evening. Great. Thank you. Uh, Madeline Dardo. Hi, folks. My name's Madeline Dardo. I'm a policy analyst for the CSG Justice Center. Senator Ballant. Hi, I'm Senator Ballant. I am here to listen in. I am the majority leader in the Senate. I'm very interested in these issues. Thank you. Jessica Brown. Hi, I'm Jessica Brown. I use she, her pronouns. And um, I am a public defender in Chittenden County Public Defender Office, and I am one of the um, community member appointees by uh, the Attorney General's Office. Sheila Linton. Um, Sheila Linton, she, her pronouns, and I am community at large and the Root Social Justice Center. Thank you. Judge Davenport. Uh, hi, I'm Judge, I'm Amy Davenport. I am a retired a Superior Court judge, and I am a member of the uh, Children and Family Council for Prevention Programs. Great. Thank you. Monica Weber. We can't hear you, but I can see your lips moving. How about now? How about if I plug my microphone in? It's amazing. It's just amazing what happens when you do that. Anyway, I'll start again. Monica Weber, Administrative Services Director, and I'm representing the Department of Corrections. Great. And I would... Um, Tyler Allen, who is our a new representative from DCF, first time this evening. Would you please, sir? I would love to. Thank you so much, uh, Eitan. My name is Tyler Allen. Uh, I am the new Adolescent Services Unit Director over at the Department uh, for Children and Families, so I work closely with Elizabeth Warren. Um, and I am DCF's representative in this group. Thank you all so much for having me. 
Jen Firpo, please. Works so much better when you unmute yourself the first time. I'm Jen Firpo. I'm a training coordinator with the Vermont uh, Criminal Justice Training Council. Great. Rebecca Turner. Hi, everyone. I am the head of the appellate division and the Defender General's designee. Uh, David Scher. Yes, David Chair, Assistant Attorney General and Co-Chief of our Community Justice Division, uh, Division and AGO representative to the panel. Sarah Friedman. Hi there, Sarah Friedman uh, with the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Great. And Jeff Jones. Hi, Jeff Jones. Whoops, yeah, Kenya. Jeff Jones, and I am, a, I guess, at large appointee of the SA's office. Great. Wonderful. Did I don't think I forgot anybody. It's so hard because people talk and then icons disappear and it makes me a little crazy. But I think I got everyone. Did I? If anyone got left out, this is the moment to announce yourself. Hot damn. Did it. Nailed it. Thank you. Announcements. Um, there are just two. Judge Grierson sends regrets. He had another meeting that came up that he had to attend this evening, and so he will not be with us. Um, similarly, Chief Don Stevens, who is another um, at-large member, community member, will not be able to be here. And he wanted me, however, um, given the email that I wrote yesterday to extend thanks to both Rebecca Turner and David Scher for preparing the two documents that um, are, I sent out with that email. And he made a point of wanting to, uh, to thank them. Um, those are the announcements Does that, that I have. Does anyone else have announcements? Can we make announcements unrelated to the topic at hand that I just, wanted to, I just wanted to pass along some information and hope that you all um, will help me pass it along. Some of you might know related to the justice reinvestment bill, the Department of Corrections um, is proposing a rule for earned good time. And that rule, um, has some information in there related to victims, and we're trying to make sure that we get information out about the public comment period on the rule. Um, and there's, so there's information posted on our website about the public comment period, and the rule is there. And I just wanted to post it in the chat for people um, yeah. so that you could see it and pass it along to people that you think might be interested in commenting on the rule. Great. Pepper, did you want to say anything about that? Pepper's been uh, helping me with this too. <laughs> just wanted to add also, Monica, I think um, I'm right on this, but there's a uh, public hearing on the rule on October 26th. That is, that's the public comment. So basically that's the information that I'm going to post for people. So if you wanted to, people can send comment either in writing or they can call in or dial into this team meetings and leave comments um, at that meeting as well. So uh, okay. you are correct, Pepper, yeah. Okay. Uh, David, one more thing. If you could try sending the email to Julie Scribner once more, she's still waiting to get in. Oh, okay, I, I will try again. Yes, thank you, <laughs> thank you. I would do it, but there's only so much multitasking I can handle. Um, all right, the, well, tonight there really is only one agenda item and that is the presentation and discussion of the work of the Act 148 subcommittee um, and consideration of those two prioritized lists that went out to you concerning data collection. Um, as we get going though, I really would like to say um, 
people were really amazing in getting this together. Um, certainly, um, Rebecca and David did a lot of amazing labor in just gathering documents, as did many of our colleagues. Everybody with the um, CSG spent an enormous amount of time culling, I don't even want to think, <laughs> and just getting documents to us that helped us actually come up with these two, um, these lists uh, that you now have. This is, it's rather like an iceberg, folks. You're looking at the very, very tip of it. And we've spent the last month underneath the surface of the ocean. That, 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 <laughs> that huge body of stuff is all down there and it's been refined into those two lists that you have. Um, I would, I, um, who else? I mean, Kristen McClure, Pepper, uh, good Lord. I mean, Robin Joy, Karen Gannett. I, I, I just, the list goes on. People were just really, really amazing in pulling this together. And one of the positive sides of this, I think, is that we now have somewhat imperfect, um, a sense of what data exist, um, where they exist, in what forms they exist. Oh my God, Elizabeth Morris. Oh my God, I can't believe I forgot her. She did like an enormous amount. Poor woman, I don't know how she like did her job and then like got all this other stuff to us. I'm gonna keep doing this and forgetting people and I'm gonna be really guilty, but a lot of people. Um, Monica pulled out stuff. Everybody just pulled out stuff. And now this data is there. And <laughs> I think it was Rebecca who made the comment, I think half hearted with a little bit of humor, but I was kind of like, yeah, that's a good idea. Now we need to put it in a time capsule so we have it and can <laughs> never lose it. And it's all gonna be in one place. And I think we should bury it somewhere two thirds the way up Camel's hump or something. And then no one will be able to get to it except us. Um, which isn't very transparent, but it is safe. So um, anyway, I just really wanted to say that an, an enormous amount of work went into this. Um, I normally come into these meetings, as I think you know, with a pretty rigid idea in my head of where to go. I don't now. Um, what we got to at our last subcommittee meeting a week ago, were these two lists in priority, with priorities put down on them? Because we really did feel there's just no way to go to every high impact, high discretion moment that there is in both of these systems and say we need data on all of it. It's just logistically not entirely possible, though it would be lovely. Um, so we thought at that point that the reasonable thing to do, given also that we timed it the way we did, was that this was the moment to bring all of the work back to the panel as a whole, to get feedback, to get criticism and so on. And then quite possibly we go back as the subcommittee and do a bit more refining depending on your feedback. And after that, as far as I can tell, uh, we start writing. We start writing. Um, I don't think that'll be too onerous, frankly, but um, that would be that would be the next step, I think, after we take into account things that you have as a whole body to say. Um, so having said that, I would like to invite anybody to, including the subcommittee, obviously, to, to go over those two lists, one having to do with the juvenile justice system, the other with the adult criminal justice system, and basically attack. Um, this is the moment for it, uh, because I imagine a fair amount of writing will take place between this meeting and next meeting, along with adjusting and 
we'll get it into as good shape as we can get it between now and the next meeting because we won't have December's meeting. The, the reports due before then. Judge Davenport, your hand is up. Oh, here we go. Um, I, well, I wanted to say I, I was very impressed by the list of data. Um, data is, uh, I, I spent, um, I don't know, can't remember now, <laughs> almost 10 years, 10 years as a chief judge in, in Judge Grierson's position. Um, and had a real focus on data. Data is really, really important, so important to making really good decisions about how how change um, needs to happen. So I was really glad to see this um, this the both the juvenile data collection, which is near and dear to my heart because I'm on the uh, Children and Family Council since since I retired. I'm on now on the Children and Family Council uh, for uh, prevention programs, which is the state advisory group to the uh, for Vermont for the to the OJJDP, and is particularly important in terms of looking at juvenile data, and particularly important since 18 year olds are now included. Uh, as uh, part of uh, as delinquency uh, or a large part of charges against 18 year olds are now included as part of the delinquency um, uh, and uh, uh, delinquency in juvenile court. And come July 1 in 2019, um, it would 19 year olds will also be included. So it's very, very important that we have that we that not in addition to adult data, which I don't for a minute want to detract from, but that juvenile data is so important um, in, 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 in terms of racial disparities. So um, because the juveniles, that, that when, when you get into the system as a juvenile, the likelihood is that you will continue in the system as an adult. So, um, so I was really happy to see both the, the the comprehensiveness, and even if we can't get all of that data, the fact that we are putting out a very comprehensive list of data um, is uh, is extremely important. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Do do you have any? Is there? Are there gaps that you can see? Are there are there any issues that you would want us to address? You know, I did not see any gaps immediately. Um, there may be there may be some, but the lists are 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 the lists of data are pretty long. Um, I, I'm just thrilled that uh, in a you know it, currently the statutory um, requirements only only focus on stops it assumes that somebody's in a motor vehicle and that they are stopped and it assumes that an adult uh, someone who's considered an adult is in a motor vehicle and is stopped but there are many many other ways in which and, and probably, I, I mean, I hesitate to say the majority because I never actually looked at that particular data. How many people come into the criminal justice system who are because of a, a motor vehicle stop versus how many people come into the um, adult system because of, for other, other reasons other than a motor vehicle stop. But I have to believe that it's, it, it's, a, it's a large proportion um, and juvenile data is nowhere mentioned in current statutory requirements for reporting the data. So to have juvenile requirements as well as a much broader interpretation of the kinds of data that we need um, about who gets charged versus who gets stopped because they happen to be in a motor vehicle. Um, is 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 really important. Um, so 
uh, I mean, racial racial discrimination certainly includes people who are stopped on the street for uh, for, for for being the, right. you know um, as opposed to people who happen to be in a motor vehicle. Um, and so I'm I'm delighted to see that it's uh, to, to to look at a broader the, the statutory requirements need to include a much broader um, uh, definition of what needs to be kept in terms of data. Great, thank you. Rebecca, your hand is up. Thanks, Eitan. I actually was uh, wanted to take advantage of the opportunity of, of Judge Davenport being here, and I appreciate you being here and um, and getting your reaction specifically. And I appreciate the comments on the juvenile chart. Uh, I, I wanted to get your reaction as to our prioritization um, within that sort of huge comprehensive list of data collection. Would you agree with what the subcommittee and others too, of course, but part what 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 Eitan and David did was send out charts, which was twofold, right, in one document. For the juvenile, the first page, I think, is, or first two pages, is how we prioritize the data that then, in following, is the comprehensive list. And I think to summarize, there's sort of two groups at that you can characterize the prioritization. And they're similar both in the criminal and juvenile um, system context. Uh, two groups, one is metrics, Right, so collecting data on metrics, related to metrics, demographics, right? Uh, the second group are, are decision-making points within this uh, system, and we started expansively from pre-charge, right, Pre and, and initial contact to post. And the subcommittee generali generally agreed that focusing on the front end pre, in the criminal context, pre-conviction, in the juvenile uh, system and delinquencies, we included the merits, um, partic and I think disposition, David, um, per and, and the difference there was because of the timeliness and, and, and the issue, but the concern raised by the subcommittee is we're starting to highlight the entire decision-making point. So right. while you're, the, the second question is an emphasis and inclusion of schools in the juvenile chart, recognizing that while our charge had been so focused and primarily focused on the criminal side, on the juvenile system side, we wanted to somehow capture the significance of the school to prison pipeline. And we tried to capture that there in the initial data uh, row related to initial encounters, not just being limited to law enforcement or DCF, but to include schools, knowing that was huge. And we did spend a great deal. I mean, Sheila Linton really was very instrumental in bringing that to the subcommittee's attention. We were very focused initially on speaking about encounters with a very traditional notion of law enforcement. And she reminded us that for many juveniles, the figures who function as law enforcement are, are teachers guidance counselors, people of that nature. Right. Um, so um, assuming that question, that question is directed at me, I, I think it would be wonderful if we could get that data. Um, I, I think that data is going to be harder um, because there isn't a statewide, um, uh, but maybe it will prompt a call for some kind of statewide data system that uh, that has to be um, that as school as a school if a, it, whether it's a teacher or a school resource officer or whoever it is who makes that referral that they have that that has to be um, that we have to get data on that um, I, I think that would be amazing. <laughs> Um, uh, it, it, it's, it, it, it's sort of, um, uh, beyond a little bit what, what we've ever thought of as possible, but if we could get that, wow, that would be, that would be huge, huge. I, I mean, I can't even begin to describe for you how different that would be from how that data would help us um, 
figure out policy recommendations that are that are helpful in terms of um, in terms of dealing with the disparate treatment. Um, it, it, we we just don't have any sense now of what that is. So yeah, I'm I am totally. <laughs> I'm totally on board with it. I hope it works. Um, my uh, um, uh, so uh, my 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 way prior way way prior experience as a as a legislator, which I was for six years prior to becoming a judge, is like uh, they may go ah oh, how how do we do all that? But but they have the they have the ability and the authority. To be able to figure that out, and it is so important to trace it back to where the initial charge, you know, information about the charge came from, and why did you decide to charge versus why didn't you take this kid and put them in a, you know, say, okay, you need to do something, but you don't need to be charged. Um, that's that that is really key and trying to figure out where are the school districts where we have issues versus where are the school districts that are doing it right mm -hmm. and saying okay hey here's the school district that's doing it right why can't we take what they're doing and bring that bring that thinking to the school districts that are still struggling to figure out how to, how do we deal with this kid so anyway my thoughts Thank you. Anyone else? This is this is the time to weigh in. As I say, I'm not feeling very organized because I really just wanted I wanted open feedback. That's what the subcommittee needs if it's going to, I mean, it can certainly go back and keep going, but in it needed to come to the whole panel. I guess everyone's really happy. Oh, Jen, your hand is up. Yeah, actually, mine is um, it's more of a question. Um, and I'm really excited to see that socioeconomic level was is one of the things that we want to capture. But I wondered if the committee could speak to what what did they mean by socioeconomic level? Are they going to be looking at family in, you know, capturing a family income? Are we going to have like broad categories? And how do we manage that? Imagine that we're going to get that information at various points. I mean, I'm. I'm of course thinking law enforcement and they're having an encounter with somebody and they're collecting this information. Are they then as part of their stuff, are you imagining that they're going to ask, so how much do you make a year or? That would be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems like there could be some awkward. So I think it's a fantastic data point to get. Um, I just wondered if you guys had any thoughts on how we were going to get there. Aton, could I weigh in on that? I already thought you would. <laughs> so we were not in this initial conversation in the subcommittee trying to really reach that question of how <clears throat> how we're going to get it we had a very we had this exact same conversation in the legislature when we talked about bail reform and trying to capture people's ability to pay um and uh you know Judge Grierson, who's not here tonight, was very clear that, you know, the court doesn't have any ability to uh, investigate people's ability to pay or to look at people's um, socioeconomic status. But we did think that it was an important data point and that we could look at things along the lines of public defender applications, for instance, um, and and think about um, and, you know, my main point here is we didn't really think about how to do it, uh, but we did think that it was an important data point to consider um, when we look at uh, just demographic factors and sentencing disparities. Um, so that that was my brief, uh, you know, justification for adding that in there. 
Jessica. Um, hi, that Jen's question and, and Pepper's response prompted a question for me. Um, first, I want to say like that I really appreciate the hard work of the subcommittee because th these lists are really, really comprehensive. And I think like I, I certainly don't see, can't think of anything else that's missing or could be added um, in terms of data points. So my question is, did the committee, so Pepper kind of just said spe specific to um, the data point that Jen identified, um, Pepper said that the committee hadn't really talked about or, or, or reached a conclusion about how you would data would be collected about that specific data point. My question is, is that a more general comment? Like, it, did, the, did the committee talk at all about, I mean, this is a lot of data, um, and I think it's probably beyond what CRG is collecting right now. And I guess my question is, like, did the committee sort of talk about if we're making this recommendation to the legislature that these are important data points, like are do we are we planning to make a recommendation as to how we're going to start collecting all of this data and information? We might no short no because there was a moment where we all realized that we weren't data experts. And that we we none of us know how to how to do data integration, any of those sorts of really, really detailed technical bits of work we don't know how to do. And so there was a decision at that point to just talk very broadly, also given the fact that we don't have that much time just define, here are some broad things, and to put into the report that we recognize that these are broad recommendations. We recognize that we haven't necessarily given uh, direction into how to come up with some of the data, but at the same time, we didn't want that to stop us from saying that this needs to happen and that somebody needs to be found who knows how to do this. Meaning, yes, money, hiring someone who does this for real. I mean, I think money is always involved um, for sure. Uh, but I would also say I don't think we should overlook that. I do think that there are resources in this state, um, in addition to what CRG is doing, that maybe, you know, come funded. I mean, we have lots of universities. Um, we have a law school, um, so I would just, at this point, you know, very initially suggest that we could be looking at resources with that are that are that are in our own state where there are experts who do this work. Okay, thank you. Um, look, Monica, can you, you go and then Judge Davenport back to you? Thank you, Aton. Um, the other thing I wanted to raise on this list is. Um, the list talks about the, the prioritized data we think is important, but it doesn't actually say whether or not the data is available or, or um, not available. Some of the data, particularly data uh, in the criminal justice for the adults, um, is available. Um, a lot of the information that comes from the Department of Corrections is on, is on this list is available. And one of the conversations we had, I know Karen and Robin both said this at one point during one of our meetings, is that they were going to be able to go through and maybe do some analysis and say, we know that this data is currently collected and this data is not collected in order to identify some gaps. And I think that will also help legislators um, maybe zone in on where they want to prioritize um, starting the data collection pieces. And my, I had a second point, which was also related, I think, to the recommendation that we were going to sort of pull out of our report from last year, two years ago, around yeah. data collection. Yeah. And we were, just, we were just going to sort of reiterate that, that theme, right, that there needs to be some investment somewhere um, in order for them to be able to answer the questions that they, that they continue to ask and that we, we continue to ask. So, thanks. Judge Davenport. So, 
So I think I think one of the things that's important to remember about this data is whose perspective is this data collected from? Um, certainly with respect to racial and ethnic uh, identification, um, the data is important from the perspective of the law enforcement officer who stops the person. Did they stop the person because they thought that person was black? Or uh, did they stop the person for whatever reason? Um, the, 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 um, when we look at data on, in terms of who, who got stopped, why, we're looking at data from the perspective of the law enforcement officer who stopped that person. Now that person may not self-identify as black, mm. but the important point is that the officer saw that person as black or saw that person as white. Um, that's what tells us uh, what whether there is a disproportionality in terms of who gets stopped. So I think in, in addition to looking at what the data is, um, so s someone might self-identify as African-American, but in fact, from the officer's perception, they appeared to be white. And the officer viewed that person as a white person versus an African-American person. That is, that's really key. And a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people think that the data on who gets stopped and who doesn't get stopped is based on who actually self-identifies in what category. But the reality is it's, you know, whatever that person self-identifies, the, the importance is who did that law enforcement officer, what did that law enforcement officer see as the, the race or ethnic um, identity of the person who they stopped was? Um, so it, it gets complicated once the person gets into the system and maybe there's some, at some point during the system, there's some point where someone says, okay, how do you self-identify yourself? So the law enforcement officer identified that person as African-American. That person actually identifies themselves as something else, um, some, eth uh, let's say an ethnic, um, uh, so it, 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 it is complicated. But you have to view it from the perception of why are you asking for this data? You're asking for this data because you want to know whether the person who made the stop or whatever made the decision is per perceiving that person as from some ethnic or racial identity versus um, how that person might self-identify. And it's very, it, that, that makes it complicated and difficult, but that is really important, an important distinction to make. Okay. Can I, can I add to that? Sure. Oh, sorry, I, I see Rebecca's hand is up. Um, sorry. Um, oh, well, somebody. <laughs> I, I would just echo what you just said, Judge Davenport, in that we did delve into that in the subcommittee. Uh, and that's why I think we decided that the how could just mire us down in, I mean, the deadlines for this report are very aggressive. Um, I think we need to have the report submitted by December 1st, which right. gives us, I think, one more meeting after tonight uh, of this full panel. Um, and so we, spent two hours talking about the how and thinking about police of you know observed versus self-reported and those kind of issues that you're discussing and so that's why we kind of decided to jettison the question of how at least for now um 
and think about these high discretion, high impact decision points and make sure that we at least had something concrete for the legislature to consider by December 1st. No. Jeff Jones, you have you've been silent and have a question or comment. Well, as always, uh, the longer you wait, the less your comment makes I'm any sorry. impact. However, that being said, um, I I would really like to uh, add something to to what uh, her honor, his honor, I don't even know how you're supposed to say that now. Um, stated, which is that when a law enforcement person approaches a car, they're making financial determination from the condition of the car, from the model of the car, from if there's rust, is it a Mercedes, and their actions from that point are incredibly pointed. And it's kind of a double bubble if you get some of the way white, but they'll grab a car with a muffler hanging down and treat those people in a different way and push them into a system when normally, if it was a brand new Mercedes, they'd probably just give them a warning. And that's, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I hope you don't disagree with me, but that's as impactful for the poor as it is for anyone of color. Rebecca. I would add that uh, we, we certainly did uh, risk getting completely derailed by getting stuck on the house and and the whose perspective was a was a critical part of it and not just the law enforcement but at the later stages and whether or not we were making sure that the data questions was ensuring that we got that perspective from each of the players particularly the ones making the decision points from the prosecutor making the decisions on the charges from the judges who are imposing the the hold without right or the secure detention or the life without possibility of parole, right? So, but then, right, Eitan is right, that like he was, he, he re redirected us to be, uh, to be productive. And, and, and in, in the way that, A, we're not experts, that, that these very questions are why we have experts in this field doing this, right? The data analysts, the, the criminal justice, uh, and, you know, analysts. And so I think so, while we have these charts, I'm hearing so far from several people the question of hows, right? And going to Monica Weaver's point, which is which is what I would suggest here, the how came up not just the one time, but sort of repeatedly as a theme in the subcommittee. The how unpackaged further is really two hows. How to initially map the data that we want to collect, right? how we do that to identify data gaps and data that's currently siloed and available, right? How do we do that? Second how is how do we collect the data we, we uh, the legislature eventually requires and how do we do that, right? A second how. I think Monica, you referenced back to our older report that touched on those themes and I would encourage us as a panel is going back and reminding that. And I think we touched on it on the second part of the how, right? Where we envisioned and hoped, I thought in summary, right? And maybe I'm wrong, maybe this got into the secondary or detailed, but it was key to that. And going back to Jess's question, right? The capacity, like looking at who has the capacity to do this. And maybe it's not a single entity, right? But we, we look at who's available within Vermont outside. So who the capacity question is, is critical to the how as well as independence that we want to make sure that whoever is collecting and reporting this data is independent, right? Is not tied to a certain agency that's tied with law enforcement that meets best practices and standards peer reviewed or whatever is the standard. Again, I don't have the expertise for this. Um, the how of mapping the initial question, we started getting into a little bit because the studies that CSG collected that we all sort of pulled out uh, showed that there are programs out there. You know, the Harvard Law School Life Center around that program mapped out for the Massachusetts judiciary, their system on data and data gaps. So I understand that there are places that can come in, come in and CSG provides a great model coming into the state last year doing that mapping for us and reporting back at a quarter. Like there are people who do this professionally and they can do this pretty quickly so that we don't get stuck years and years later trying to figure out the initial how. 
Okay. Oh, Sheila is back. So let's, uh, Sheila, you have a comment or question. Let's go to Sheila and then Monica and then back to Judge Davenport. Thanks, Aton. Sure. Um, yeah, I just, I want to reiterate what basically everybody is saying is that it was very specific of this subcommittee that this wasn't our focus of the how. That, of course, we took into consideration because there were many concerns when we were bringing up discretion points of then how would we do that. But our point is, is that that's not what we've been mandated to do was the how. What we've been mandated to do, from my understanding and direction, is to prioritize and to figure out what are the um, high discretion points and what is the data that we feel like is there, isn't there, has gaps or whatever that needs to be collected around racial disparities. And then I want to also say that <clears throat> we have to sort of name it to tame it. Some people know that phrase. And so I'm just going to use that phrase because it's a phrase that many people know. And part of the reason why we created these two sheets and focusing on the um, juvenile saw, I'm so happy that you're here, um, Judge Davenport, because I'm um, happy to see you actually, as well as for your insight on these things, because um, I agree that juvenile is where we should be focusing and we should be focusing upstream. But one of the other reasons why we sort of name these things was really about creating um, these conversations. So now that we've actually have these charts and people are like, oh, wow, how are you going to do that? Before, if we didn't even name it, we wouldn't even be having the conversation of how, of thinking about that thing or how we might get to that thing that we want to get to. So for those of you who are legislators on the call and for my personal own senator who's on the call, um, that um, just reminding us that we know that with many of us together, we can be creative of the how and that the subcommittee that I don't know how many of there was of us, like nine, 10 of us, however, I don't even know anymore how many <laughs> were on our subcommittee, <laughs> but that we weren't to end all or be all to making the how happen. And yes, we had a lot of knowledge and expertise in that space. And there's so many other people who have that to offer as well. And I just hope that the legislature will look at this and others will look at this as a means to open up our eyes of like discovering like, wow, like what you said, Judge Davenport, like the juveniles is not even encountered. I don't know the terms that you use, but it's not even really accounted for in the data collection. And that's like shocking. And that if we were to actually do some of the things that we're suggesting in this, though it may be difficult, this could totally change the dynamic and the paradigm in which we're working in. So the only other thing I wanted to say was around um, some of the feedback that we actually put into this email, because I just wanted to give space for other people to talk because I was on the subcommittee. But since other people are not quite taking that space right now, I just wanted to chime in about um, what we sent out. And just to reiterate, um, we have a section in there that was in our email bulleted number four that I believe talked about the confidentiality of information, something around the sorts of that. And I just want to say personally of how I feel um, being on that subcommittee and I voice this on the subcommittee is that as we talk about certain discretion points and certain data that we wanted to collect, such as the one that's on the bottom around sanctions, there was some concerns around um, confidentiality, as there is with concerns around confidentialities because of um, demographics being so small that they might identify um, individuals, populations, or people. And we also discussed how um, that has worked to our disadvantage and how that has been actually manipulated or manipulated into um, not keeping that information. So for example, we talk a lot about Native First Nation people, and a lot of times we're not able to collect that demographic information because then we're identifying those groups of people. And therefore, then when we go to do whatever we need to do, we, we use that as an excuse of, well, we just don't have the data, even though we know that First Nation Indigenous um, people are saying, hey, we're disproportionately impacted. So I want people to, when they're reading this, that I take that very serious when we talk about the confidentiality, both on that level of demographics, as well as the level of sanctions, that I'm about transparency and, um, and that we're humans and that we're imperfect and that that there should be checks and balances for everybody in all systems. And so it makes me uncomfortable that other people feel uncomfortable without having accountability in their roles, such as judges potentially, or other um, people who are in power positions, that they would question that accountability. And so I'm hoping again to where we express that we don't wanna 
muddy the waters around confidentiality. But I, I will personally say as a person who was on that committee that I do want to muddy the waters and I do want to get messy. And I do want to change the system as we've as we've known it. Um, and the last thing I just want to point out to people in our sections around the schools and really starting from a younger age and looking at schools, you will see in that category that I see that we chose to put it as a bullet point and not up at the top. And I just want to um, be really clear that mandated reporters. Um, is in that category, and I don't know whether it should be up at the top. I, I see that we wrote it in a in the bullet point of that section, but I want to maybe revisit that to be at the top so it's very distinct within those um, first dis discretion contact points that we talked about not just within schools, but we talked about within our communities and how so many people within our youth specifically within our communities, um, so many people are mandated reporters and many people, many youth um, have contact with the system through a mandated reporter that is not necessarily in a school setting. So I just wanna really emphasize that part and, and really to go off of what Judge Davenport said was like that juvenile and really getting those kind of statistics and stats, though it's not currently in place, um, that's what we're here to do. We're here to shake it up. We're here to change the system because if we weren't, we wouldn't be talking about trying to eliminate racial disparities. Thank you. Uh, Judge Davenport? Uh, am I? Okay. I think I, 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 I think I have once again remembered to unmute myself. It, it's always, it's always a, a demanding, you know, like you know, you have to remember to do that um, with these uh, virtual meetings. Um, such important comments. So, so I guess my um, my take is what's important is to look at who the decision maker is and what the decision maker perceived as being the racial or ethnic. Um, identity of the person in front of them, because there are certainly um, th that's what tells you whether there is bias, <laughs> not whether the person who is actually being uh, who is who is the defendant, for example, in the in the criminal justice system or the juvenile justice system, self identifies as being uh, as being a particular racial in a particular racial or um, ethnic group it is how the person who makes the decision so in the case of law enforcement it's how law enforcement officer viewed the person that they ultimately charged um, what did, what did they see as that person as that that person's ethnic um, because they can't they they should not God forbid they should not be asking that person oh you know what's your racial identity what's your ethnic identity they shouldn't be asking that that's wrong and they know that that's wrong so the question is what did they see when they stopped that person or when they picked up that person or they um, as being their identity. Right. Um, so, so, so that, that is really the key. And I think it's really confusing for a lot of people because a lot of people want to see, okay, what percentage of the population who is charged or stopped or whatever is self-identifies as being black or being of some ethnic particular identity. But that's not the question. The question is, what did that person, what did the person who's, who had authority, who perceived that person, what did they see um, as being their ethnic identity? And I think that that is an issue that is Often, um, it, it is really an issue that is it, that you, you constantly have to remind people um, because we're not supposed, and we shouldn't be. We should not be asking 
each juvenile who comes in front of the juvenile court, oh, and what do you think your ethnic identity is? Or what do you think you are, you know? No, that is not the question. The question is, what is the judge who is making this decision perceive that that person's identity is? And did that change, did that flavor or change their okay. decisions about what should happen as an outcome for the case? Okay. So that's really all, all I have to offer, but um, it, it is really such an important distinction and it is one that is really hard for um, for folks, in my experience anyway, for folks to understand that that what we're looking at is not how the person self-identifies, but how the person is perceived by the person who had authority over them. I would like to take now Monica and then Jeff, and then I want, because we're at the hour point, I want to sum this up to a certain degree because I need to direct us in a direction that has to do with action points for the subcommittee going forward, given that we have about six weeks before this is due. Monica. Thank you, Eitan. Yeah, I think this goes back to maybe Rebecca when you were speaking and some of the conversation around how and then you know, links in, I think, um, what Judge Davenport was just saying. I think across um, these intercept points, there may be um, different mechanisms, for instance, how we would identify a person's race or um, other types of, of demographic information. And we, as I recall, in our subcommittee conversation, recognized that maybe we're not the experts in doing that. And I remember having a conversation about gender, right? What are the categories? How how do we need to ask that question on, on gender? Maybe the same thing on race. And perhaps there are differences um, at these various intercept points, you know, and I think I've mentioned to people in the past at the Department of Corrections, you know, our practice that we're really trying to work on is ask the person how they identify and record that um, in an acknowledgement of, of giving them the opportunity to be able to um, really tell us how they identify as a person. And so my point in bringing this up again is that we recognized as, as a subcommittee that we weren't really sure how to answer that question. And then that was one of the things we wanted to bring up in our report is that we needed to get more advice and input from experts on that particular topic. Right. Thanks. Jeff? Yeah, I guess the point of my ramble was that, to me, the reality is almost always rule of appearance. And rule of appearance pretty much dictates from elementary school all the way up to superior court how you are treated. And self-identification would certainly offend most people if asked at roadside. Um, I think much of what goes on is rule of appearance. And I think that is, Etan, I'm sure you're, you're hip to that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to just sort of summarize the two main takeaways that have come out of the last hour for me, and they will be incomplete, which is why we have a panel. Um, but th that one was what Jessica brought up was some attention, even in a limited way, to the how to speak about perhaps directing the legislature to look at resources such as the law school. Um, UVM, I would imagine as well, places like that. The other was to, oh boy, I had this in my head and now it's gone. Uh, Sheila wanted to put at the beginning of the juvenile list the entire issue of mandated reporters, which goes so much further than just even being schools, um, and that that may well need to be put really, really close to the top. Those are the two things that are popping out right now. There was a third I had in mind, 
it has now gone away. But David, I'm hope you're writing those down because we will need them. <laughs> Thank you. And um, if there are other people who've got some takeaways from the last hour, really focusing now, folks, um, on what we, we can go back to discussing, but I don't want to lose the takeaways that need to go back to the subcommittee that need to be included in the report. Those were my two. I'm looking for hands. Hey, Tom, I, I, oops. Go for it. <laughs> Here's my hand. I would add to that that I heard um, discussion around the, the critical question of, of from whose perspective are we trying yeah. to get this data from, right. right? We focused in the chart the decision points, but of course there are lots of people involved during the decision points. And I think I heard at the end there the suggestion of it being from the decision maker, right? However, I think also summarizing to defer to the experts who are not us <laughs> who to, to, to weigh in on this. Right, right. Thank you. Anyone else? As I say, we can go back to the discussion. I just don't want to lose. I, I want to take the distilled action points so that we have something to go back and work on. That's all I'm trying to do at this moment because it's six past seven. Any others that people have? Let me also direct your attention as you think about this to my email of yesterday. Sheila already did bring your attention there that uh, towards the end of the email I wrote, uh, the subcommittee felt that certain points needed to accompany the documents that you now have. Um, the following points are simply a result of David's note taking and are open to reworking. Um, and I'm imagining also these are certainly things that will be expanded in narrative form and put into the final report. Um, the first was the upcoming report should include the panel's recommendations about what data is important for the state to collect. It will not include a study of what data may already be available or the difficulty of collecting that which is not. We were quite clear about that, but we there seems to be some discussion here on that. So that's good. We're we working it. Two, this report focuses on data in accordance with the legislature's request, but qualitative feedback, information, and stories need to be a part of any complete study of our criminal and juvenile justice systems. Robin Joy spoke about that, oh, I don't know what, two months ago really talked about qualitative analysis. Um, Sheila brings this up regularly. Um, and there are people who study this, right? There are, this is like a whole field. So that's, that's again, not something that's just pie in the sky for those of you who don't do this. Three, data should be collected in accordance with evidence-based uh, standards and best practices. Four, which Sheila mentioned in recommending that a wide variety of information be collected, the report is not suggesting the unlawful disclosure of confidential information. And lastly, young people may have many contacts with adult authorities like teachers that are a critical part of the story of their potential involvement in the juvenile justice system. But these contacts may not be captured by data that is limited to youth involvement with ju juvenile courts. This information is nevertheless vital to understanding our juvenile justice system. It sounds to me like we've gone through these, but if there's more, please feel free. Tyler, you're looking very thoughtful. I can't hear you. 
Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Okay, now we can hear you. <laughs> so there's a lot to think about here, and I'm trying very hard to, you know, get caught up to to where the group is at. And clearly, a huge amount of thinking has gone into this. Um, and I, th I think just as you were as you were discussing there a moment, um, I, I'm also thinking about how Judge Davenport's point I take very well that we need to be looking at the perceptions of people making decisions around other people. Um, but also, I think there's some questions coming up in my head about the perceptions people have of the interactions being had to or you know, that are projected to them. And so particularly when we talk about school, if I'm a student and I perceive a teacher or an authority figure addressing me in a certain way that is different than my peers or something like that, that that seems a data fact, you know, data point in there too. Um, and all these, I, I, it's it's impossible for me to at this point carry this without my brain wanting to go into the how question. Um, so the, it, it's it's always a tantalizing of how do we get at that question. Um, so I do appreciate the wisdom of this group acknowledging that that's something that we need to package separately and yeah. give to people who do that. <laughs> I didn't even want to go there. I had a moment, frankly, just to, I, I just had a moment. We were getting lost in the weeds. We were just just how, 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 and it was like, oh my God, we're not any of us qualified for this. We don't have the knowledge for this. So just stop. <laughs> That's not what the RDAP is. So yeah, it's tempting. We know. <laughs> we know just how tempting it is. Uh, Anyone else? Rebecca. So I take that question to be a uh, comments on those list, those one through fives that were in that email you just read. I, yeah. I just want to make sure that point four, which goes to um, in recommending that a wide variety of information be collected, the report is not suggesting the unlawful disclosure of confidential information. I just want to make sure that David, or, or we capture Sheila's point that she yes. made earlier, right? Which is, the ca the caveat is sure we we if there's if there are laws on the books right we're not suggesting anyone break laws however the reason why we need this and maybe there needs to be a revisit right of of things to prevent this the key is transparency and accountability and not just at one you know not just at law enforcement but all the people who are making these key decision uh, these decisions so that was one I just want to make sure that was captured and then back to one which again, um, I think you made reference to it, which is your last sentence there. Uh, it will not include a study of what data may already be available or the difficulty of collecting. I just want to make sure that that even if we are not getting into the weeds on the house, because we are not experts, that I'm hearing from this discussion that hey, there's this sort of natural instinct, as it was in the subcommittee, to kind of be like, oh gosh, how can we think of asking for this? It's, it seems impossible. I feel like we should in our report, and I think it's referenced in number three here, which I like, that goes to the collection. And I suppose how I see sort of the how is as an initial how, the, the initial data mapping of the system to see what data exists and doesn't exist based mm -hmm. on the identified decision points that should be collected on. There's that how. And then there's the secondary how, right? Who's going to do this? Um, I st I hear us. I mean, we made a suggestion on the bigger how, right? I suggest that we don't hesitate to provide some general guidance, which is I think that's I think you talked about it with Jess with with reference to Jess's point with resources, right? I think resources within Vermont, but it's also the expertise. And and when we talk about that, I'm also talking, I want to just make sure capacity and independence is added. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that I just wanted to make sure those points, I think that we have the ability to suggest that. And I, I feel like that is consistent with sort of some themes that have been coming up throughout the panel. Yes. Uh, and I think it's critical to get in this report. I, I hear you, thank you. Uh, David. 
Yeah, so um, just responding to that, I was thinking about the exact same thing, Rebecca, with respect to Sheila's point I, on bullet four. It, I had tried to capture that kind of by omission, which is never a good way to try to capture something. Um, but the I, I think we should say explicitly at the end of that bullet point that there is, uh, you know, at a sentence that says something like, and we can refine this in the subcommittee, but says something like, um, this is not to make any judgment or recommendation about what should, what information should or should not be confidential and make it very clear that we are leaving that point up for discussion um, and sort of leave open Sheila's point, leave that open for debate, Sheila's point about um, uh, let's think hard about what needs to be transparent here because uh, I think that's valuable and not one that we should unintentionally foreclose uh, by not being clear about that. And with respect to your the other point about, um, you know, what data is available, it does sound to me like we're moving, you know, that my notes that I transferred into bullet point form, it does sound to me like we are making a little bit of an amendment there in terms of Perhaps we will make some notes about what is available or unavailable. I think that's fine. I, I don't think we should be wedded to that bullet point or those prior thoughts. And if we ha we can get we can gather some of that without too much challenge, I think it's fine for the subcommittee to spend a little bit of time just doing a brief outline, perhaps with a caveat that this may not be complete, but a brief outline of what is available. Well, and we also have, don't forget, and I should have said this earlier, Monica pointed it out um, that the crime research group had said that when we actually get these lists in some kind of final form, which is pretty close, I think, from what I'm hearing, um, they will then take them and determine what information is available now and uh, make that available to us so we can put that in the report. Monica, you had your hand up. I do. I, I think I need a clarification and it may not be mm, something we can do in this meeting, but the bullet point three, data should be collected in accordance with evidence-based standards and best practices. And then I heard a lot of people talking about um, independence of collection and independence, um, I think, of analysis, um, which I think is really important. But when we use the word collection, I guess I, I am curious if we're talking about sort of the primary collection point, right, which is, I'm going to speak from my perspective, from the Department of Corrections, um, the data that would likely be used is data that our staff are putting into a database. And maybe that's the same for, for DCF, right? And um, <clears throat> so the independence of the data collection there um, in order to achieve this sort of like high quality pure data doesn't seem to fall in line with what I think we're talking about, unless the why collection you mean taking that primary data from different departments and putting it together and collecting it in an independent way and then analyzing it. <clears throat> and I'm not sure I'm making my point, but I saw a couple of people nod. <laughs> so Tyler, if you if you can, if you understood what I said and have some different way of saying it, maybe that would help. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. I, I think what I'm hearing you say, Monica, is that we need to use all of our agencies to look into what data we can, but that data be furnished to somebody who independently is analyzing said data, right? Right. We're going to collect oh. it. Yeah. <laughs> We're collecting the data. Yeah. And I heard some conversation around independence of data collection. And I so I just want to, maybe we need to make a distinction around yeah. collection and the people who are actually analyzing it. Okay, I get it now. Thank yeah, you. Sorry. No, Thank you, Tyler. It may be a matter of my own density. Um, Judge Davenport. Um, so just to keep in mind that uh, in juvenile proceedings, as in criminal proceedings, um, law enforcement is required to uh, indicate when um, the law enforcement officer who made the the stop or the charge or whatever it is 
um, indicate what their perception is. And we have 20 percent of law enforcement officers right now who are saying with respect to uh, racial or ethnic identification, I don't know. Now, I don't know really does not help us. Uh, or unknown, I think that, that I think it's unknown. It doesn't help us. It doesn't help us know what that that in, that officer saw with respect to that person. Um, in a, in a way, it's saying, well, it's unknown because I didn't ask that person what their racial or ethnic identity was. Well, that's not the point. The point is your perception of what the racial and ethnic per ethnic identity is. And if you have 20% of the cases in, in juvenile that you don't know, that, that are unknown, that really skews your data in terms of the degree to which, um, to, the, the degree to which there is an ethnic disparity um, or racial disparity. So, you know, I, I think it's really important to make sure that law enforcement officers or whatever the, whatever the identity of the person who's making the decision understands that this is their perception. This is not the self-identification of the person that they've stopped. This is their um, perception of who this person is. Um, because otherwise, you end up with you, you you don't you end up with data that's not very helpful. I I think I I just I do have to say here I I can very easily imagine being in a position and often am where I do not know the race of the person I'm talking to, and I can very I look at them and go there's some form of brown. What form, I have no idea. And I think we do, though, have to take that into account, that it's fair for someone, particularly in the emerging demographic of the United States, to say, I'm not actually sure what this person is. Three law enforcement officers of my acquaintance have said to me that they get completely confused with someone and they don't know what to write down. And they're really frustrated by it, partly because a lot of the categories, for instance, on the tickets, don't seem particularly relevant. So I, I hear what you're saying, but I also think we do have to accept the idea that someone really doesn't know. Uh, and I guess my response would be, how then do you recognize, how do, then do you evaluate racial disparity? Do you evaluate based on the 80% that had, had a perception of one or the other, or do you evaluate it? You know, that, that, that's the question. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's, it, it, it's a hard one yeah, um, because it can make a, in Vermont, it can make a huge difference. Sure. Tyler, you had your hand up, and then Rebecca Turner. I don't know, if Rebecca, if you had an answer for Judge Davenport, because I was uh, um, uh, approaching a different can of worms. So I, I could welcome you, somebody else to respond if they had a response for Judge Davenport. Tyler, it's Hello. Rebecca. Hi, I, I just posted, I did, I was just responding and I posted it in the chat um, just now. And, and the question and the suggestion perhaps is, should we recommend, and it sort of goes to the how or how, you know, whether it's in one or four to suggest not just the con consultation of experts um, and, and um, Mo Monica's point on clarifying collection and analysis, but also suggest that there's training, uh, appropriate training for the ones who are collecting. Yeah. Right. Jen Fairpo. So on this subject of training, um, I can let the cat out of the bag a little bit because we actually now have confirmation that we got the grant. 
Um, but the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council, yay, yes, has gotten a grant um, that will um, give, will allow us to hire someone to give all of Vermont law enforcement training on uh, race on race data collection uh, in, in conjunction with uh, traffic stops. And that's all going to happen theoretically next year, assuming that we get the money when we're scheduled to get the money and the whole state contracting uh, process doesn't blow up in our faces. But but that's that's where we're headed with that. So there right. there's some resources being allocated. We're so excited. <laughs> <laughs> money. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and, uh, and, and jumping in one more point on that, I, I meant not just training, but consequences. Wasn't there legislation, David, Julio, recently uh, that passed, or I forget, consequences for, for police to not provide the data required by the legislature related to funding? Yes, absolutely. Um, they're not going to be, if they don't collect their race data, they are not going to be eligible to get grants. So we should make that recommendation here as well. Like, you don't collect this. We're going to train you how to collect it. You don't deliver. These unknowns are unacceptable, right? Okay. And 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 it should be related to more than just stops. I agree, uh, I but the but the grant specifically it's it's through uh, Governor's Highway Safety, so it is specifically targeted at stops, unfortunately. And I don't know. I haven't read the whole grant yet myself. So I don't know how much wiggle room there is in there. I'm hoping some because I have, frankly, other fair and impartial things that I'd like to spend some of that money on. But we'll see what we can do. Tyler. Thank you, Aton. Uh, the the thing I wanted to mention earlier that was bubbling in my head, it was a thought prompted by um, something that Sheila brought up earlier when we were talking about um, confidentiality um, versus transparency. Um, and I think that point for me is well taken that uh, if we are using confidentiality as a as a method by which to not be transparent, that is um, uh, indicate indicative of a really problematic behavior from a systems perspective. I've also taken part in enough evaluations to understand that. Um, uh, you know, when you have internal review boards involved when you're doing, you know, a study or something like that, they want to make sure that you can't be identifying specific people. And so for me, I fully support the idea of systems being laid bare in terms of transparency. Um, but uh, I caution us to, to exercise caution, I guess. <laughs> I would encourage us to exercise caution when it comes to the impact of individual people who could be um, identified or, you know, that, that could have an impact on people's life. So um, it's just something to be mindful of. That might be a little bit of a how question or how thought. Okay. okay. Anybody? My sense if is that with these caveats, which David has written down in his wonderful way, um, the subcommittee needs to go back, refine this a bit, the, the, these two documents, um, turn our attention to the matters that have been raised this evening, have some limited discussion on these matters. And I would say, begin to write. Um, if, <laughs> how to put this, if anyone would like to write, this would be a good time to volunteer. If not, I will do my thing and you guys can take it apart and put it back together and have fun. Um, and I'm certainly willing to do that. But if someone else would really love to do it, that's fine, too. I thought I saw Rebecca's hand go up. I did. You're going to write it? Uh, with you and, and okay. maybe that David. Actually, I, <laughs> that was my fantasy. <laughs> All I right, Jess. Want Sheila. All right, no, okay. I'll, 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 I'm hoping I'll have some help, but I'm I happy to count me in. My I'm fantasy with that. Yay! 
sometimes in 2020 you get what you want. Who knew? Um, <laughs> so d- should we vote on that? No, David's shaking his head. Uh, how? Okay. Someone needs to make it into a motion because I can't by definition. But what I'm suggesting is that the points that have been raised this evening about the point, the bullet point, uh, the two bullet pointed sheets, prioritize sheets, be given back to the subcommittee for further discussion and refinement. And that we begin to write the report, um, the draft of the report, bearing all of this in mind. And that would be what my suggestion is. Someone else would need to make a motion. This is Jessica. I'll put my face on. Whoops. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm, I make a motion. <laughs> Um, that the subcommittee further refine the documents that they shared with us today uh, to eventually turn that into a written report, which will be written by Aton and Rebecca and maybe some other people if they can recruit them. That's my motion. I second. Anybody sec? It's been seconded and thirded. All in favor? Okay. Um, got it. Great. All opposed? All abstentions? Motion is carried. That's what we're going to do. So um, then the subcommittee will meet a week from today from 1 to 3. Um, invitations will be sent out. And we will go from there. I also just want to say we're, I think, I'm delighted. I think we're in much better shape than I really thought we were going to be in two months ago. I was not happy. I was actually distinctly unhappy. But I'm happier now. Not that that matters, Mm -hmm. but I am happier. I think, I think, I I think it matters. I think it well, matters that you're happy. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I mean, I just feel like we're in a position to actually get something done and give it to people who are at the moment turning their attention towards this. And I think that's exciting. Um, and moving, frankly, and moving. Um, if there's, I would then like to move along then to is there any new business that people would like to oh wait wait sheila sheila you snuck your hand up <laughs> thank you Aton. um so i just had like, some clarifying questions before we actually move away from this i'm wondering if there's any tools or additional resources that people have to offer in the room for our discussions like if people if we're if we're really on the subcommittee looking at the house a little bit and if we're looking looking at any more things that have come up for people? Are there resources? Are there things? And I'm going to give an example of what came up for me when we had this conversation that I would like somebody to get us the information for, if that's possible. A few people have mentioned the uh, relevancy of the codes, something of which um, I guess um, it was specifically mentioned in traffic stops that there are all these codes and whether they're relevant or not in terms of how we identify people. And and it's come up like I think a year ago, those came up a little bit in a discussion, but I'm actually wondering what those codes are and if those codes could be supplied to us because I really um, thought it was interesting to think about whether the codes are relevant to how we need to collect data based on race now. And it made me think of when people were talking about and specifically Judge Davenport was around it's the um, person in power and how what their perception of the identity is, it started to really make me think um, of really um, of of sort of the point is is are they black brown non white <laughs> you know so, so it's like yes um, like people might look at me and I could be perceived as ambiguous some people might not even consider me a black person. I don't know. I'm not really sure how people perceive it. But the point the point is is like are we are these 
you, we talk about these codes and how we identify people and we're talking about racial disparity. So even if the perception of the identity and they're like, I don't know, to me, if you don't know that if you have to think twice about whether that person is non-white, maybe the questions that we're trying to ask are not so um, specific, like, is it black? Are they Latino? Are they indigenous? Maybe it's like, are they a brown or black person? Or are you to perceive them as white? And not to have it in the weeds, because you're absolutely right. There's so many of us, especially in the state of Vermont, who are considered racially ambiguous, who identify with multiple um, racial identities at once, um, who can pass. I mean, there's so many nuances to that. So I really, I'm really interested on the how and really interested. And I'm, I'm disappointed that that grant only looks at traffic stops, as we've said here today, that I would like to know um, as well, the um, sort of the difference between the traffic stops and the um, encounters that are not traffic stops. Um, some, I think it was Judge Davenport that brought that up in the beginning as well around that differentiation. And I'm really curious about that. So um, those are my thoughts. I would really like to see more of that because I would like to not work within a system that isn't working for us. I would like to see what pieces of that system are not working and then change those pieces. And if there are pieces of the system that we think are working, which I'm not sure there is, but um, if there is, then to build off of that. Sheila, I can get those categories for you from traffic stops. Great. I'll bring those to the next meeting. And it sounds as though, I guess the other question I have with that too, do they collect data that are non-traffic stops? And it wasn't, it, I, I wasn't clear to me if we can get that, that as well. And if those codes are the same, and I remember when we had a data session like a year ago, uh, maybe with Stephanie, maybe it was, um, yeah. she mentioned that, that, that each department's codes don't align with each other as well. So Correct. when you talk about the codes, I'm not even sure where that source is coming from. If what I heard is correct, that each department and its codes, at least then, was different in how they interface with them. Okay. Six minutes. Jen? Yeah, so as Sheila, first, I just want to tell you that I personally, I share your disappointment that that grant money is only on um, traffic stop data, but unfortunately, as I'm sure you know, with with grants, you, you, they put this, the people giving us the money put the strings on the money, and it, it stinks, but um, but I wanted you to know that I absolutely share your disappointment there. Um, as far as the the codes, if you're talking about um, the, the, on the back of the ticket, the, the race options, um, I don't know that those are necessarily the same for everything other than traffic stops. I think that probably depends on whether they're what um, computer system they're using to keep their data, and it's pretty much Spillman or Valcor. Right. So, okay. and 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 they don't talk to each other that well yet, but okay. <laughs> yay. <laughs> Sarah Friedman. Sarah? Okay, Sarah's not here, I guess. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Hey, can uh -oh. you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm so sorry, my computer went green when I tried to unmute. Um, okay. <laughs> but I, I just wanted to say, and I'm happy to talk about this further in the next subcommittee meeting, but um, I do have guidance from the CSG Justice Center's research director on how we recommend best practices of collecting race data throughout different points in the criminal justice system. So this is not traffic stop specific, um, but related to those other discretion points, we do have a little bit of guidance and kind of what's considered best practices on on collecting race data. Um, I think I might have mentioned this at a previous meeting, but um, it's it's not extensive or very detailed, but kind of broad strokes about what our research shop recommends around this. Okay, thank you. Judge Davenport. Um, yeah, the answer is yes, in terms of when a charge gets filed, whether it's an uh, adult criminal or it's in a juvenile matter, 
um, the petition or uh, informa information in the adult context um, will reflect what the law enforcement officer perceived um, the race as being, but that could be unknown. So um, that, that, that's an option. It, uh, so it's race or ethnic, um, uh, ethnic identity, or it could be unknown. Um, there is nothing that I know of that tracks the judicial officer in the judiciary system, which is all I really know about. Um, uh, in the judiciary system, there's nothing that tracks what the judicial officer's perception is when they sentence a, um, a, a defendant, uh, when they decide on a particular sentence for a defendant. Uh, um, there's nothing that uh, the, the 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 race or ethnic identity would still be the perception of the officer at the time of the arrest or um, the bringing the charge. Um, there's nothing that tracks what the judicial officer viewed that person as. So, for example, if there was a person who, going back to an earlier conversation, who the police officer identified as being white, but when they're actually in the courtroom, the judicial officer perceives them as having uh, a, a, another ethnic or racial um, uh, definition. Um, there's nothing that would tell you that. What you get from the court data is whatever came in when from the that that tracks back to um, the law enforcement officer's perception of identity. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Now I am asking for new business, if there is any. I am taking that for a no. Well then, I will close us out tonight by first of all, just saying thank you to everyone. This has just been an extraordinary amount of um, cogitation work, just grunt labor of finding things online. And I, it's, it's been really inspiring. Um, and maddening and wonderful. And we will convene again as a full body on the 10th of November from 6 to 8 p.m. once again here in Cyberland. Um, and I'm hoping everyone will be well, both intellectually and emotionally, as well as physically. I would entertain motions to adjourn. Or not. No, I'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'll second. I'll second. All in favor of going home now. Or we, wherever we, I am home, but yes. Okay. All opposed for some unknown reason. And those abstaining. Oh, hell, I'll just abstain. <laughs> Rand, everyone have a great month. And I will talk to you all next week, some of you and the rest of you. Sometime before the seventh of November. Be well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank you, everyone.